following is a video presentation of a worship service at Orville Baptist Church. Thank you for that good singing, and it's good to see all of you in person in the house of the Lord. Certainly good to see the choir back. Amen. Let's give them a hand. I'm glad, choir, to have you back. We've been missing you and your smiling faces and all the music, and thank the Lord that you are with us today, and we look forward to days ahead and Sundays ahead, having the choir and full compliment. Looking forward to the day when we can begin to have... Even more folks come and be part of the in-person services. And we certainly appreciate those who are watching us online. But uh, what a joy, as I've said many times, to be able to gather as we welcome one another in person in the house of the Lord here at Orville Baptist Church. We're delighted uh, that we have the opportunity, as Joan has stated, to gather and worship and truly there are not enough words adequately to express uh, His worth. But we'll do our very best through singing, through the preaching of His Word, through praying and every aspect that we uh, have the opportunity today to share uh, our, our heartfelt praise to our Lord. But as we welcome you here this morning, let me encourage you to take your Bibles as we do every Sunday and open the Scripture. And we're going to look together at the book of Joshua. That's going to be where our message is coming from today in chapter 14. So stand with me if you're able. And let's look together as we give our attention to the reading of God's Word. Look at verse 6 and following. If you would please. Now the men of Judah approached Joshua at Gilgal, and Caleb, son of Jephunneh, the Kenzanite, said to him, You know what the Lord said to Moses, the man of God, at Kadesh Barnea, about you and me. 
I was 40 years old when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to explore the land. And I brought him back a report according to my convictions. But my brothers who went up with me made the hearts of the people melt with fear. I, however, followed the Lord my God wholeheartedly. So on that day, Moses swore to me, the land on which your feet have walked with your inheritance will be your inheritance and that of your children forever because you have followed the Lord my God wholeheartedly. Now then, just as the Lord promised, he has kept me alive for 45 years since the time he said this to Moses while Israel moved about in the desert. So here I am today, 85 years old. I'm still as strong today as the day Moses sent me out. I'm just as vigorous to go out to battle now as I was then. Now give me this mountain, this hill country that the Lord promised that day. You yourself heard that the Anakites were there and their cities were large and fortified. But the Lord helping me, I will drive them out just as he said. You may be seated. You want to keep your Bible open there because that's where we're going to be looking in just a little while as we think about this subject matter. You see it in the bulletin. Giants, grasshoppers, and gray hairs. Or you could say it another way, grasshoppers, giants, and gray hairs. Any way you want to cut it, that's what we're going to be talking about this morning. And you'll see where I get the title of my message as I share that in just a little bit. Let's join together in prayer. We always have much to pray about. And at the conclusion of the service, we'll update our prayer sheet. And you'll see in your bulletin this morning... On the back of your outline is our prayer list, and we'll update that. So let's bow together in prayer. Father, we join our hearts together in prayer. And you commanded us and taught us about the privilege and necessity of prayer. It is not a meaningless exercise. It is not something that is a token prayer, but it is a lifestyle for the Christian. To be one that constantly and perpetually prays to the Lord about all things. You told us to bring our request to you with thanksgiving and not to be anxious for anything. And yet we know there are a lot of things that trouble our nation this morning. So we pray for our country, our community, our churches as we deal with some of these issues and problems with COVID and other things that are going on. But we look to you to give us not a spirit of fear, but a power, love, and a sound mind. So as we pray today, we ask that you infuse our churches with the power of your Holy Spirit. Cleanse us. And create in us a clean heart and a right spirit within. We pray for our dear sister church, New Horizon, as well as all the churches in our association. The churches around Anderson preaching and sharing the gospel message that you will, this morning, hide all of us behind your cross. And as we share your word, may you be exalted May saints be edified, and may you give us souls for our labor. Bless this service today. Grant us your favor. Give us ears to hear what the Spirit is saying to the church this day, this hour. We pray this in Jesus' name. Stand. <clears throat>
Thank you, choir. Thank you all for being here this morning. Take your Bibles and your outline, and we're going to look at a passage of Scripture that perhaps you've been a Christian for very many years. You're familiar with the story of Caleb, and I'm certain that many of you, maybe all of you, have at one time or another heard uh, a preacher talk about this story and made a reference to giants and grasshoppers and gray hairs. And so we're going to look at this. Uh, years ago, I remember reading this passage of Scripture and found out in the book of Numbers, there were giants and there were grasshoppers, and we'll look at where we get the gray hairs from. But here's a story of a man that there's not much written about him. His name really is one that's in obscurity, and only a few references are uh, given about Caleb. Now, we know his partner, Joshua, among the people of Israel. The story is Joshua and Caleb were two among the 12 uh, men and spies that were sent out to spy out the land. That it was Joshua and Caleb that came back and gave a good report. Uh, but they were in the minority. Now, we know a whole lot more about Joshua than we do Caleb. But just because his name is in the shadows and his name is one of obscurity doesn't mean to minimize his importance. And I think Caleb is representative of all those Christians <coughs> who are part of the master's minority, the, the master's few who stay committed, even though their name is, they don't make the highlights. They don't make Christianity today. You don't read much about them. And I want you to see the significance of this man named Caleb. And we're going to look at this passage of Scripture and in your outline. I'm going to give you a little heads up, and I'm going to give you... Uh, the answers to your outline. So take your outline, and I'm going to help you fill out most of it right now, but there'll be a part of it you'll fill out a little bit later. We're going to be looking at Caleb's number one, his character. So you want to put the word there, character. Secondly, we're going to look at Caleb's confidence. That will be the second word. And then out of his confidence, we're going to look at Caleb's courage in just a moment. Now hold on to your seats. I'm not going to give you the answers to the three subpoints underneath that. You'll get that in a moment. But I'm certain you can figure it out. The fourth, we'll look at his victory, his conquest. So with that in mind... Let's go ahead and look at Joshua chapter 14, and then while you're having your Bible open there, uh, find the book of Numbers. Just a few books back, I want you to look at Numbers and go to chapter 13 and keep your finger there because we'll be looking at that in just a moment. So I want us to look at some things here from Caleb, who is 40... Five years later, when he had received the promises of God, and he reminds Moses of the promises God gave him way back in the wilderness when he was 40 years old. Now here he is, 45 years later, he's now 85. Perhaps there are some at Orville Baptist Church that have reached that age. And beyond, I, I know of what some, such one that not only is 85, she's will be Lord willing in May 101. Miss Zelma Dodgins, we celebrated her 100th milestone last year in the Christian Activity Center. 85 years of age. Well, old Caleb didn't have anything on Zelma, but I want you to see something about his life. And how he impacted uh, his generation. 
Because it's a reminder that regardless of what your age is and my age is, God can use us and wants to use us all the way till the time he says it's time for you to leave earth. Caleb wasn't asking for retirement. He wasn't asking for a rocking chair. He says, I, I'm still strong. I'm still claiming what God promised me. And Caleb, while he was one in the shadows, faithfully stayed committed to God all those years. And God fulfilled that promise to Caleb. So let's see how these all these hang together, these four points. First of all, I want to talk with you briefly about Caleb's character. What was it about Caleb's character that was so significant as to God giving him that promise? Here it is. The key to it is found in verses 8 and 10, where three separate times it is a reference to Caleb's wholeheartedly following the Lord. He says, I wholeheartedly, I wholly committed my life to the Lord. I mean, he didn't uh, serve the Lord half-heartedly. He served the Lord wholeheartedly. Look at that word again. How, I, however, he says in verse 8, follow the Lord my God wholeheartedly. And then in verse 10, he says, or 9, I wholeheartedly follow the Lord my God. And so over and again, you see something about his character. Here was a man all of his life who could be counted on to be fully and totally surrendered to God. And yet he was there in the wilderness. Nothing was said much about Caleb, but he quietly and faithfully made his journey with the Lord and stay committed to the Lord wholeheartedly. Someone well said, a half-hearted Christian is one who is faint-hearted. You notice what it said there in that passage? He says, the men that were with us, those uh, 12 spies, 10 of the 12, he says, they caused fear. And they caused the people's hearts to melt. But I, however, was not faint-hearted. I wholeheartedly trusted God. And so it's very important to understand uh, uh, the importance of one's character. Now, you know there's a difference between character and reputation, right? You know what reputation is. Reputation is what others think about you. Character is what God knows about you and your spouse. <laughs> you see, a lot of people have this impression, I need to have a good reputation. Listen, folks, you need more than a reputation. You need not to worry about how to impress people around you and get people to think uh, uh, something about you. You need, and I need more importantly, to say, God, it doesn't matter what people think about me. It matters what you know about me. And God knew in the heart of heart of Caleb, here was a man who was wholeheartedly, not half-heartedly committed to God all the way. You know what the Bible says? A couple of scriptures I will throw out to you. A double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. And then in another passage in the New Testament, it says, if your eye be single, then your body will be full of life. All those scriptures are telling us that God does not accept half-hearted commitment. I know some who say, well, if I could just give half of my life to God, or if I just do 50%, or what if I give 80%? No, God says you're to love him with how much of your heart? How much? Part of it? Some of it? All your heart. Not 90%, not 99%, but all of your heart and soul, mind. And that was true, certainly, of Caleb. He was not faint-hearted. I recall early in my college days and then subsequently in seminary, hearing the story over and again of Dwight L. Moody. Many of you probably have, are familiar with the Moody Bible Institute, and maybe have read the, uh, you know, the magazine uh, and, uh, and listen to, you know, Moody on the radio. But, you know, one of the great stories about D.L. Moody, that God used him in a profound way. 
D.L. Moody, it was said about him, literally shook two continents for Christ. And on one occasion, on his second trip to England, invited to come speak, he was out there in an open field, and he heard in this open field an evangelist by the name of Henry Varley. And Henry Varley made this comment in his preaching the day that D.L. Moody was part of the audience in that open field. Here is what Henry Varley said in his message, and I quote, The world has yet to see what God can do in, through, with, for, and by a man who is totally and completely surrendered to him. There in that open field on that day, once those comments were made by Henry Varley, Moody bowed his head in prayer, and he said, and I quote, I'll be that man. And God used D.L. Moody in such a marvelous way because D.L. Moody was a man who had surrendered completely, wholeheartedly to God. And he shook continents, two continents for Christ. But let's look secondly, not at only Caleb's character. Here's the second word. What did we say the second word was? Caleb's what? I just want to see if, testing you, see if you wrote it out. Did you write down the second word? What was the word? Confidence. Do you have confidence in God? You see, the reason why he was able to claim that mountain where did this confidence come from? What was it rooted in? Well, it was rooted in those statements that were made there in Joshua chapter 14. Three separate times, Caleb refers to this phrase, And God said, and God promised, and God spoke to me. What is he saying? He says, my confidence comes uh, on the basis and is rooted in my faith in God. Ladies and gentlemen, the Bible says faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And so he is simply saying, listen, I'm going to tell you where my confidence is knowing what the Lord has said to me. Forty-five years ago, he spoke to me. And he promised me, as I spoke with Moses, that this inheritance was going to be mine in reality someday. That at the moment he spoke that word to me, I had yet to actually claim in reality that mountain and that inheritance. But 45 years ago, when he spoke that word to me, I, by faith, appropriated that as though it had already happened. And ladies and gentlemen, that's what the writer of Hebrews says. Faith cometh when he talks about what is faith. Faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things what? Not seen. We believe by faith based on God's word that it's already a reality. Even though immediately we have not actually put our foot on the ground, we claim it as though it's already happened. And so, ladies and gentlemen, his confidence was rooted in his faith, and that's based upon not positive thinking, not optimism, not a feeling. That I can do it. It's not a hunch. Faith is not looking on the bright side. Faith is taking God at his word. And when God speaks to you a word, you can take it to the bank. He's not going to speak to you and me his promises as we make promises. The Bible talks about that in the New Testament. God is one who keeps his word. Now, how many of you know that from time to time, because of our fallen humanity, we might make a promise, but maybe not keep that promise? Have you ever broken your promise? Raise your hand. Come on, we all have. The old timers used to say, my word is my bond. But with God, he always keeps his word. God is faithful to his word. 
And when Caleb heard that word 45 years earlier, he held on to that promise. And he says, I have confidence that what he promised me 45 years ago, it will come to pass. And all those years, every day, he kept claiming that promise of God. And please understand how important it is to have that heart of belief. The writer of Hebrews also says in chapter 3, Beware, lest there be in any of you a heart of unbelief. You see, faith is, and belief is not a matter of the head, it's the matter of the heart. You can believe something in your head and believe some things right about God's Word, but you've got to know experientially in your heart. God says it's a heart matter. So unbelief is not a mental thing, it's a moral thing. And here, Caleb not only showed his character, but exemplified his confidence. But it led to number three. What's number three? I forgot what it was, so I need your help. Caleb's what? Courage. Now, here's where you're going to get the title of my message. I want you to see that Caleb, just like you and just like me, faced three foes. And that's why I want you to go to Numbers chapter 13. And we're going to see what obstacles Caleb faced. Here's a man, when everybody else was whimpering off like a whipped dog... When everybody else says it can't be done, here's a man that says, I know we can take the land. Remember that story? The 12 uh, spies go out into the land, and God says, I'm going to give you a land flowing with milk and honey. And sure enough, when they spied out the land for 40 days, it was exactly as God had said. However, God didn't tell them the surprise that they were going to encounter. So these 12 go out, and of the 12, only two, Joshua and Caleb, came back and said, we can do it. The other 10 said, oh yeah, there are figs and pomegranates, and there's everything God had promised, succulent, wonderful gland that God promises. However, there's some things that we face that we know we can't take the land. Now notice with me quickly. What Caleb said in verse 30 of chapter 13. Caleb, after they all were afraid and giving a a bad report, Caleb steps up and silenced the people before Moses. And here's what he said. We should go up and take possession of the land, for we can certainly do it. But... The men who had gone up with him said, we cannot attack those people. Now here's what these ten saw. And you and I, sometimes when we have problems that we think are insurmountable, we too face these foes. Here are the foes. First one in your outline, under courage, Caleb faced the giants. Now let's look at it. Look at, uh, again, Numbers 13 and, and, and the last part of that, verse 31. But we can't attack those people. They are stronger than we are. And they spread among the Israelites a bad report about the land that they explored. They said, watch this, the land we explored devours those living in it. And the people we saw, here's where I get giants, and the people we saw there are of great size. We saw the Nephilim there, the descendants of Anak, who come from the Nephilim. Now, what is he talking about here? He says, there were large giants in the land. I mean, these guys were just strong, and they'll devour us, and they'll eat us up. And Caleb says, I know someone who's a giant killer. (laughs) And sometimes you and I see problems 
as becoming so insurmountable that they become gigantic problems and we look and focus on how hard they are, how big they are, that we have fear and say it cannot be done. And when I think about Orville Church and other churches like ours in this community, few in number and have not obviously had the number and resources that they've had in years past, it's easy to look around and see all of the big problems around us in our community and say it's just too insurmountable, Pastor. How can we overcome and take the land and impact our community? We're small in number and the problems are overwhelming. I grant you they are seemingly insurmountable. And yet, the scripture says, I, you can do all things through Christ who gives you the strength. And Caleb says, we can go in because God is the giant killer. And if he says he'll do it, it's not in our strength. And we're always reminded of, remember, David and Goliath. And remember what David said? We're not, I can't kill this giant, Goliath, in my own strength. But he says, I come to you, Goliath, in the name of the Lord of hosts. <laughs> what killed Goliath? It wasn't David. It was God enabling David because God was the one that says, strength that you have comes from me to kill that giant. And so any problems you and I face, they might seem to be gigantic, but we need to be able to say with God's help, we can overcome. Listen to this verse, verse 8 and 9 of chapter 14. You don't have to turn there, you're close to it, but if the Lord delight in us, then he will bring us into this land and give it to us, a land that flows with milk and honey. Now listen to this. Only rebel not against the Lord. Neither fear the people of the land. Now listen to this next phrase. The King James puts it this way. For they will be bread for us. Did you catch that? The ten that spied out the land said... The giants will eat us. And Caleb says, no, we'll eat them. <laughs> A matter of perspective. They're going to be bread, B-R-E-A-D, not B-R-E-D. God will allow us to swallow them up. And that is exactly what happened. Oh, for men like Caleb. But not only the giants, and perhaps you are facing what you seem is an insurmountable, gigantic problem. Maybe it's with your health, maybe it's with your finance, maybe it's with your spiritual walk, but there are so many people are facing what they think, again, is insurmountable problems, gigantic problems, and they're not turning to God for their source of strength. But not only the giants is a, were a foe, there's the grasshopper mentality. Notice again in chapter 13, the very end of that verse, chapter 33, not only did we see the Nephilim, the giants, but watch this. The latter part of that verse says, we seemed like what? Grasshoppers in our own eyes. And we look the same to them. They have what I call grasshopper mentality. The giants are too big to overcome. And we're too small to overcome. Be careful of those two extremes. Life's too hard. I'm too small. I'm only one. What difference can I, a grasshopper in their sight and in my own sight? You see, it's important that you don't underestimate what God can do through you. You say, well, I'm just one person. I, it's too big. God has demonstrated and continues to demonstrate in our world all he needs is a few. And with one and with the few, if you and I will not have that grasshopper mentality, we're too small, we're too insignificant to ever get the work done. Again, if you are a grasshopper in your sight, you won't get it done. 
But God says you will be surprised that through your weakness and your smallness, I will show you my strength and my greatness. And so we need to say, God, it's by faith I exchange my weakness for your strength. God, I need to look to you. And so that the enemy won't intimidate me and make me think that I'm so small that nothing can ever be done. And the battle is the Lord's and he can use me. And don't let the devil intimidate you. But then the third thing that I want to quickly point out. Not only did he face the grasshoppers and the giants. What else did he face? Well, you see the title, gray hairs. He was not a spring chicken anymore. I mean, he wasn't 25 or 30. He was 85 years of age. And he says in verse 10 and 11, look, just as the Lord has kept me alive, and there's a whole lot that we can unpack just with that phrase, because when God says, uh, I'm your strength and, and, and number your days. Remember this, God has an appointed time. It wasn't Caleb's appointed time to go home. He basically said, the only reason why I'm alive is because God kept me here. And when he's through with me, I'll go home. But until he's through with me, I want to remind you that I keep on traveling because it's God who's given me breath. God is keeping me alive. He's got a plan and a purpose for my life. And you'll not go home until God says, I'm ready for you to come home. And he says, God has kept me alive all these years, for these 45 years ever since the Lord spoke. And he says, now I'm 85 years old. And notice what he said, I'm strong today, as strong today as I was in the day that Moses sent me. As my strength was then, even so my strength is now to go out to battle and to go out and to come in. Now, you think he was a young man that throughout his years kept his physique and was an Arnold Schwarzenegger or a Lou Ferrigno or someone who was, you know, Mr. Universe and all these muscles rippling. We don't really even know what physique Caleb had, even when he was 40 years old. But do you think even if he had this strong physique, muscles everywhere, that he still had those muscles at 85? No, friend. What he was telling them had nothing to do with his physical prowess. He was saying, my strength when I was 40 years old is the same as it was 85 years of age because I'm talking about my strength that comes from God. I'm not talking about the physical, he says. I'm talking about the spiritual. Just as God equipped me back then, he equips me now spiritually. And so he is saying, it's not the physical strength that I'm referring to. I'm not talking about bulging biceps. Even if he had them at 85 years of age, do you think he could have went in there against those giants? No. Even if he was a 25-year-old young man, full of his prime, he would not be able to take those giants down, even with all that. Even if he looked like Arnold Schwarzenegger. He says, no. My strength has always been and now at 85 it is the same strength because God is the source of my strength and ladies and gentlemen that's what Orville Baptist that's what you need and I need as we go forward in 2022 God it's not through our might but through your power and your strength and we're going to ask you to demonstrate your strength that we can go out and be able to accomplish great things. Even though we are a now aging congregation, God says the days ahead can be just as great and fruitful as they were in years past. Don't just hanker for the good old days. The good old days are right now. Let today be the good old days. Start saying, God, use me, whatever strength I have left, whatever. I might physically be out of my prime, but Lord, spiritually, I'm never out of my prime. The inward man is renewed daily, even though the outward man perishes, the scripture says. Douglas MacArthur said, when you think about youth, youth is not a time of life, it's a state of mind. It is not a matter of red cheeks, red lips, and supple knees. It's a temper of the will a quality of the imagination, a vigor of the emotions. It's a freshness of the deep springs of life. 
He goes on to say, youth means a temperamental predominance of courage over timidity, of the appetite for adventure over a life of ease. This often exists in a man who's over 50, more than a boy of 20. Nobody grows old by merely living a number of years. People grow old by deserting their dreams and ideas. Worry, doubt, self-distrust, fear, despair. These are the long, long years, he goes on to say, that bow their head and turn the growing spirit back to dust. You are as young as your faith, as old as your doubt, as young as your self-confidence, and as old as your fears, as young as your hope, as old as your despair. End quote. And what Douglas MacArthur shared years ago still rings true today. Well, that leads us to our last point. We know about his character. We know about his confidence. What was the third one? We know about his courage. And what was the fourth one? Did I give you the fourth one? I think I did. Caleb's what? Huh? Caring. Not caring. That's close. Caleb's conquest. Remember I said victory, then I said conquest. Caleb's conquest. And the Bible says, and the Lord gave him the land. Ladies and gentlemen, my prayer for Orville Church is that God will help us to appropriate by faith those things he has promised us in the future and to say, God, give us this community for Christ. Give us the victory. And as we walk in that victory, we will acknowledge where the victory came from and who gets the glory. And we will say, I was just in it for the ride. <laughs> God did it. Years ago when... Baptist church that I pastored in the state of Florida. I remember when I took the church, I had just left a church in northern Kentucky, which was a baby boomer church, and we were running about 350. And the average age of the congregation, the median age of that church was probably 38. And so, I mean, we were hopping and going and glowing. And then God led me to leave that church to go to Florida. I was in a meeting in central Florida and I was doing a conference for a pastor and while I was there he said, would you mind having a pastor search team come and hear you preach? And I said, no, I'm not, I don't, tell them to come on, the more the merrier. And they said, he said, well, Rick said, I want them to hear you. They're looking for a pastor. I said, well, I'm not. I'm not looking for a church. I'm, I'm good. I'm in northern Kentucky. It's good. He said, would you let them come anyway? And I said, sure. Half of the pastor search committee came on a Thursday night, and then Friday night, the other half came. And they told me where their church was, which was about 15 or 20 minutes from that church where I was preaching. So Sandy was accompanying me on that conference, and we drove by the church. And I said, no way. It was a white building in, in this little community, and I found out that the area was a retirement community. And I said, God's not going to lead us here. I mean, we're in a baby boomer church. We run 350. How, much, how many people are this church running? 85 in Sunday school and barely reaching 100 on Sunday morning for worship. And when I went back, I had a friend of mine... Uh, Kenny, I said, pray for me. He said, I said, the church is asking me to consider this. And I gave him all the different demographics. And he said, you know, it sounds like you're, if you go to that church, you're going to the church of the nearly departed. Because it was a, because there was a retirement community. And the church average age, median age was like 65. And I just said, there's, there's no way, Jose. <laughs> And God orchestrated some events that I'll not get into uh, at this time and said, you know, I'm going to put you in a position where you've got to consider it. And the long and short of it was, through a series of circumstances, 
I receive the peace of God to go. And I want to tell you, when God called me there, it was amazing the victories that took place because I was obedient to leave a more prosperous, younger church and go to a community of retired folks and pour my ministry into them. Within a year, our Sunday school attendance increased from 85 to 285. Our worship attendance increased from 99 to 100 to 350 plus. I was amazed. 19 Sundays in a row, people came down the aisle of that church to give their life to Christ or to transfer their letter. It was just amazing. And I had many in the association come to me and say, what in the world are you doing to see such an increase? I said, I don't know. I'm just here for the ride. I said, it's a God thing. I said, I'm not preaching any different, not, not preaching any other messages different. I'm just trying to obe be obedient. This is where God called me to be. And I said, it's a God thing, and I'm just here for the ride. I'm just joining up with him. And ladies and gentlemen, we've got to have that same attitude. Let's don't look at the giant obstacles. Let's don't have the grasshopper mentality. And let's not say, I'm, you know, been there, done that. I've done my part. And I'm now I've got gray hairs. And, uh, you know, it's time for another generation. Just say, God, with your help, use me with whatever I have, whatever tools and resources I have. And God, do it again. Do it again. Bring revival. And let you just infuse this community with the power of God. Infuse this church with great victories, and let us all be able to say it was God's hand that did it all. That's my prayer for 2022 and going forward.